Gifted Overexcitabilities with John Hall. Hi, it's Diane Allen here at Someone Gets Me. And today we're going to talk about gifted overexcitabilities. And I have somebody who is living in that way. His name is John Hall. You may or may not recognize him, but he is a multi-talented, multi-dimensional man from a musician, singer, songwriter, very well known in the music world, but also very well known in the political world and the community activist world. He skipped grades in school, was educated in some of the best schools in our country, and he continues to bring his vision and his heart on stage on all the different stages that he's on. So, John, thank you for being willing to come on Someone Gets Me and talk about what it's like being gifted and having overexcitabilities. Well, you're welcome, Diane, and thanks for asking me. I think that what I'd like to start is, could you give everybody a little bit of kind of like the story? I know you skipped some grades in school and you did some pretty amazing things. You started music when you were young. Kind of give everybody a backdrop for why you would be talking about gifted and overexcitabilities. Well, um, I was, uh, I am the son of a, a PhD in electrical engineering and physics. Uh, my dad designed, among other things, the first camera that took live pictures from the moon when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And Im- imaging devices, basically, uh, Landsat satellite cameras, infrared, you know, night vision devices, those kinds of things. And, uh, and my mom, had a master's in theology and was the first woman in the United States to go to and graduate from a Jesuit seminary. And um, she uh, got radicalized, or I should say feminized, (laughs) if a man could presume to say that about a woman, when her 30 classmates got Roman collars and she got a diploma. And so uh, I kind of grew up with this, you know, a lot of different influences and Mm -hmm. My brothers and I were expected to excel at whatever we did. And we, I remember over the breakfast table at home doing calculus equations with my dad (laughs) writing them out and me and my brothers having to answer them quicker than the other brothers. And so I, I, along the way, I started playing piano when I was four and a half, four and a half years old. And my parents sent me to uh, take piano lessons after that. And I studied piano for a long time and learned French horn in school and uh, taught myself to play guitar and bass and drums. And and um, and I gradually got drawn into life, into a life of music. I skipped two grades in school. I took fourth and fifth grade at the same in the same year and skipped senior year of high school, went to Notre Dame University supposedly as a physics major when I was uh, 16 years old. And uh, my classmates were two years older than me and way more mature. And we all know that that boys don't mature as quickly as as girls do. Mm -hmm. But so I didn't last long in school, but I did play in every band I could possibly get into and uh, sing in an a cappella group and play mandolin or banjo or guitar in a bluegrass band and, and had a rock band that played um that played frat parties and football pep rallies and stuff like that and and i also played uh, a little bit in when i was in high school in a marching band and but after one semester i college spat me out and i wound up going to loyola in baltimore for a semester and that's all i did of, of uh of college, and I just wanted to play music. I'm fortunate to have one relative, my aunt Connie, the only one of my parents' generation, who told me that that it was just fine if all I wanted to do was music, and if it's what I really loved, that it was fine to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, my daughter asked me <laughs> after she graduated from uh, from Middlebury College, and you know, with a with a BA and creative writing, English, mm-hmm. and a double minor in Spanish and political science. And she had been working after that as a paralegal for a while. And she asked me, you know, she called me one day and said, Dad, I got accepted to this MFA program to study poetry at the University of Maryland. And I'm trying to decide what to do. I'm, you know, renting up an apartment at Park Slope 
in Brooklyn with one of my best friends and and I'm getting a paycheck every week that's got my name on it and I don't know what should I do and I said well probably asking the wrong guy <laughs> but, uh, because you know I said to her if on your deathbed it's possible you might say gee I wonder what would have happened if I'd studied poetry more and creative writing and you know and she wound up going to South America on a Fulbright scholarship and writing your treatise on the um, the literature, the, the poetry of of uh, Elizabeth Bishop and how it affected South American writing. And but so I'm on the phone with her and I said, you know, it's, it's possible you might wish you'd done that, but it's probably not likely you're going to be on your deathbed and say, gee, I wish I'd have kept on being a paralegal. And <laughs> wouldn't you know, she did all that and did a lot of writing and and now she's back to being a paralegal in uh, Oakland for uh, Clorox and and using her language skills. And she's so fluent at, at Spanish and Portuguese that she is translating a, a book of poems by South American writers uh, so that they can be sold in English in the United States. So it's, uh, you know, I've been encouraging her to follow tangents and, uh, you know, to follow her heart in, in whatever direction. Uh, she feels it going, but anyway. So, uh, where was I? Where was I? I, I went on a tangent there. <laughs> you went on a great tangent, but you brought the point home, right? About following our heart and and going with what feels right. Yeah, a- and using so anyway. I've I played way. music for you know basically my whole life, but I mm-hmm. I've been in different bands and made solo records. And in 1972, I started the band in Woodstock, New York. It became Orleans. Uh, I was joined by uh, Larry Hoppin and Wells Kelly, the other guitar player, bass player, keyboard player, and drummer. And we always just switched in- instruments. And uh, and uh, you know, we were, started writing our own songs and singing them and playing them in clubs. And the next thing you knew, uh, uh, nine months later, Larry Hoppin's brother Lance joined. The, he came up on audition on bass so that Larry could play less bass and more guitar and keyboard. And so that we would have a fourth voice uh, for harmony. And we wound up making two records for ABC Records that were very critically acclaimed, but didn't have a hit on them. And that's, well, I was going to say that's when record companies wanted hits. I guess they still want hits. They That's all they want. And uh, right. But we wound up uh, being dropped by them because we didn't have a hit single. And we wound up signing with... Uh, David Geffen's Asylum Records, which had some of our favorite people on it, like Jackson Brown and Joni Mitchell and the Eagles and and um, just a stellar lineup. And for them, we made uh, two albums. The first uh, was Let There Be Music that included uh, a lot of really good songs, but the song Dance With Me was the one that became a top five record and still to this day gets played around the world and on every streaming format. And, uh, it's just, I think, you know, in terms of terrestrial radio, it's been played 9 million times, but in terms of streamers, it's 140 million wow. and counting. And it's just because, well, streaming didn't start until, I don't know, 15 years ago. I mean, right, I right. didn't hear about it before that, but, it, but in that short time, uh, so many more people have streamed that song or still the one that it actually is more way more than all the radio stations that played those records since 1975 and 76 up to the present. So it uh, gives you an idea of the, the reach and impact of uh, digital media, which I don't have to tell you. So, uh, so anyway, we did, you know, we played and our drummer passed away in uh, 1986. I had, I left the band and made a couple of soul albums and then, after Wells Kelly, our drummer died, uh, I wound up getting back with the guys to finish out that year of touring that they had contracts signed for already uh, for the engagements and liked it. And they weren't through it. My partner, Lance Hoppin, is the only one of the original four that's still alive. We're still working today uh, together, uh, recording, making videos and uh, and touring when there's not a pandemic. <laughs> so, uh, All right. So that kind of brings that thing up to date. And then I took a hiatus and, uh, well, I, I was, I ran for office a few times over the years. I ran in 1989 for the 
county legislature in uh, Ulster County, New York, and won and served one two-year term. I was trying to stop a giant landfill with two incinerators that would have been the tallest structures in the county in this fairly ex-urban rural county at the time. And I managed to, you know, to do that, me and a bunch of other people, of course, uh, right. were able to stop that project that the county was trying to trying to complete. And then I left the legislature, didn't run for re-election because I didn't really plan on a career in politics. I just wanted to do something that I thought was important. And then I ran for school board when my daughter was in uh, going into her senior year of college, her freshman, sophomore, and junior years. I'm sorry, high school, her senior year of high school. Her first three years of high school, there was an austerity budget because the school board couldn't come up with a budget that the voters would pass, the taxpayers would pass and support. So I was determined she would have at least one year of her high school with you know, advanced placement classes and new computers and new tennis balls for the tennis team and uh, you know all all the things that that students you know kids of that age should should have and right. smaller class sizes. So uh, I ran for school board and won. It's an interesting thing because I'm a union member of the Musicians Union and also after the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. And I've always been a union supporter, but I ran the first time with the union, the teachers union backing um, and won that election. And then the second time I ran for re-election, my t- the teachers union opposed me and I still won with more votes than I got the first time. <laughs> so it doesn't change my feeling about unions, but, but it's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. There's a story in all this. I won't go off on that tangent now, but, but uh, so in 2005, I had been living in Nashville and um, moved back up here to the Hudson Valley to Touches County. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the congressperson, uh, a woman named Sue Kelly, who was representing me now that I had moved into her district um, and had been there for 12 years. I think she was part of the uh, the Newt Gingrich contract with America uh, 1994 class. I realized that she was voting for things like drilling in the Alaskan Wildlife Preserve or, um, you know, it just, oh, not to mention the Iraq War, uh, things that I was against. And uh, so I decided that I would talk to the other candidates because there were five Democrats already declared for the primary to challenge her. And I met with them all over coffee or lunch and talk to them about stuff. And I wound up feeling that I might be a better candidate than any of them were. And uh, so I, I decided to run and, uh, and I beat them on a primary and then I beat her in the general election and wound up uh, being going through orientation in 2006 in December of 06 during the lame duck period like we're in now. Right. I went through orientation with Gabby Giffers with uh, Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, who was a congresswoman just elected with me, um, with uh, the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, the governor of Minnesota, Tim Walls, with the uh, senators like uh, Chris Murphy from uh, from Connecticut, and really wonderful people who just happened to be in the class that I was in and, and are still making an impact in that political realm. And uh, I ran for once for re-election and, and won. And then I ran again in 2010, which was the first election after the Citizens United Supreme Court decision that let unlimited dollars come in from billionaires and corporations to support or oppose any candidate or cause. And uh, I got five million duck bucks dumped in in the last two weeks against me in negative advertising. I'm sure that wasn't the only reason I lost in 2010. It wound up being a good thing that I lost because I'm probably alive today because I did lose. But so I wound up being out of Congress and back to private life and back to concentrating on music, which is what I'm doing now. Wow. I I love the circles and the seasons. It's like as you're speaking and then before we hit record, you were telling me about some of your sailing adventures. And because we both have been sailors and I'm listening to you and I'm like, and there's another piece of 
the the multifaceted person that you are. Well, uh, thank you. I I, uh, I learned to sail from my dad when I was a kid, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was a, an engineer, so he certainly knew about navigation and angles of current set and um, centers of lateral resistance and and uh, all those things. Uh, writing moment. So, uh, you know, when I was five, uh, we spent our su Cuddy, uh, summers on Cuddy Hunk Island off of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, the only present I wanted, uh, I, my birthday's in July, and, and uh, the only present I wanted was to go sailing with just my dad, not my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was raining that day and and my mom said you still want to go sailing in the rain i said yes I do. <laughs> and so we went out you know with the two of us in a little 12 foot turnabout it was a wonderful boat to learn in um and uh was just just a mainsail you know nice little cat boat right and um that was kind of what you know i started out like that and i've i've learned so much over the years from him he, uh, he's gone, bless his soul, but he's, uh, uh, he's a wonderful man who taught me a lot about a lot of different things. I was, I used to have conversations with him while sailing mm. that were incredible. And, um, I'm actually, I've started writing a book about this that I, I need to finish now that I'm telling you about it, about, um, sailing experiences with my father mm. and, um, starting with that. Well, actually, it starts with when I was rowing a boat when I was probably three and a half or four. <laughs> they would, you know, you could put a little kid like that in a dinghy in, in the Cuddy Hunk Harbor and uh, and not worry they were going to get swept out to sea because it's totally landlocked. And the parents always watch from the porch up, you know, in the hill above. And, mm -hmm. and um, so I, you know, I had this, this thing happen when I was uh, – there's usually a southwesterly breeze that comes up midday in that part of the world. And, and uh, I, I left from what they call the Yacht Club Dock, which is actually an accredited yacht club in Cody Hunk, but it's a kid's sailing school, basically. Right. And um, so I got in this little dinghy and, uh, and rowed away from the dock. I was just going around the harbor looking at all the different boats. And, and um, the wind gradually came up and started pushing me down toward uh, a couple of big boulders on the far side of the harbor. And I was trying to row away from them, pull back uh, toward the Yacht Club dock where I had started out. And and the wind was too strong for my little arms. I just wasn't making any headway. My father saw I would, through binoculars, he checked on me. And he came down and um, got in another dinghy and rowed out to get me. And I was so happy to see him. Uh, he put a put a rope around the uh, ring in front of, in the bow of my boat and rowed. And I think I probably pretended to be rowing too while he was rowing me back. Right. And uh, but I I heard later that when I was he was getting close to me and I didn't know he was coming because my back was toward him. He heard me saying, "Somebody help!" And mm. <laughs> so the rest of my life, those rocks, the boulders were called the help somebody rocks. And, <laughs> you know, you get, but that's like an opening, you yes. know, or forward or chapter to this, this book that I'm trying to put together. Oh, that sounds amazing. It, it really is something I, I had a conversation with once we were crossing block Island sound from block Island to Cuddy Hawk or the vineyard or something. And, and, um, and I said, uh, I was having these thoughts about Catholicism, which is the relig religion I was brought up in, and uh, my more expansive view of God or higher power, deity, uh, creator. Uh, and I was, and I think my dad, you know, because people, a lot of people have this misconception that if you're a scientist, you don't believe in God, or you can't, like, what do you mean the universe wasn't created in seven days uh, and right. all the plants and animals and then humans? And um, so I asked my father about this and he said, well, you know, the way I look at it, 
and he was Protestant, converted to be Catholic to marry my mom. But uh, but so he came up in a Catholic tradition. I mean, in a Christian tradition. But he said uh, the way I look at it, you know, the the Bible is uh, uh, the Genesis, you know, story of of creation is a metaphor, and uh, it's in the in a language that humans could understand at the time. And uh, but he said, uh, I think about the Big Bang. And, uh, you know, Einstein came up with that equation uh, equals MC squared. You can't destroy energy and you can't destroy matter. It's conservation of, of, uh, of energy and matter. But you can change one into the other. And he said, you know, before the Big Bang, that we think has thrown out an infinite universe, there must have been an infinite source of energy. What was that? Mm-hmm. And I went, wow, dad, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but that was just his way of saying, I believe in God. And, you know, my, my little brother, the Jesuit priest, uh, used to say, uh, that's why they call it faith, because nobody knows for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I always say it's like a yes and, right? We can hold mm-hmm. both ideas together at the same time. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. And my older brother was an actuary. So uh, I was kind of somewhere in between. My, you know, uh, I studied a lot of science and math, but and my, my older brother was a probability specialist and my younger brother a priest. And I kind of fell in the middle where people would say I wrote songs that were too preachy. Songs that were too preachy. Um, all right. Well, see, I have what we call mid seventy syndrome. Yeah. And that is that... Um, I live on like that music. And so mm-hmm. I I was listening actually to a bunch of songs from the 70s, a, a lot of different um, groups. And, and it hit me like it was one of those things where I know all the songs. I could sing them with you. And I know a lot of the musicians who play them. So, but it hit me differently this time. It was, I, can, I think it was like a week ago or so that if I didn't know those songs were written in the seventies, I would think they were written today. Yeah. And and that there is so much in common with the cycle of life and how things go, that it's almost like those sentiments and the consciousness is trying to reemerge or maybe tried to emerge then and got stuck. I don't really haven't really thought that much about it, but I just remember going, huh, that that song, and then it was one after the other. Then, of course, I have to listen to all of them because as gifted people, we have go on these tangents and go down the rabbit hole. So yes. then I literally stayed up because I was getting ready to go to bed. I'm like, I can't go to bed until they play a song that doesn't fit this idea I had, which was another hour, I think. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. And so there's so much to be said about the power of music, the power of storytelling, the power of really connecting on that deeper level and bringing it out of us in a way that resonates with other people. Yeah. Which, and so and it really doesn't go away. A, a mm-hmm. lot of the songs are just as relevant today. Mm-hmm. I mean, of the songs that I've written or co-written, uh, right. the song Power, which was part of the whole No Nukes uh, concerts and movie and triple album uh, in 1979, that, uh, that song starts out, just give me the warm power of the sun. Give me the steady flow of the waterfall. Give me the spirit of living things as they return to clay. Just give me the restless power of the wind. It goes on. It's all about renewable energy. Yes. And, uh, you know, it winds up with take all your atomic poison power away. But, but, and I still hope they do. <laughs> but, um, but the, the focus all of a sudden is back on renewables because, of climate change. And, um, and so that song and, and others that, uh, that I've been in on, I really just could have been written today. I sent somebody a tune today, um, uh, that I recorded with Orleans, uh, plastic money that, uh, I wrote back. Oh, geez. I think it was in the nineties. Um, and the last verse of it goes, uh, 
While young and old struggle to get by, the blue chips hit another record high. But this new depression ain't depressing me. They say we're on the road to recovery thanks to plastic money. And it's all about debt and how, you know, whether we're collectively as a country or whether we're individually running up our debt, you know, the bill's going to come due sooner or later. And uh, unless we just don't pay it, which, uh, you know, sometimes that happens. But uh, but anyway, the, you know, these songs, I, I'm looking back on them and, and thinking, uh, Johanna and I wrote a song in the early 70s that Orleans recorded on our second album called Wake Up. I should send you that video. But yes. it's uh, it's a really interesting song about the environment, which, uh, you know, it's just as meaningful, I'm sorry to say, just as meaningful today as it was then. Yes, we would hope that some of them would seem a little outdated, like we've grown through and as as a culture and as humanity, we've evolved. But yet my thought was, I would like to have seen more evolution since the 70s, but it still seems so applicable, all too applicable. So I have a question about being understood. Um, Have you had time because you have these multidimensional talents and skill sets and love tangents and all of this. So um, I'm wondering if there was a time in your life where people just flat out didn't understand you. Like they would look at you like, John, you're a little bit goofy or we don't get you. And how did you handle that when people didn't get you? Now, we know your Aunt Connie like got you probably more than others. At least she supported the music part. But what about other times? Has there been anybody who just didn't understand you? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, there were times when I, uh, when I wanted to, uh, when I was obsessed with, with creating music and rehearsing a band. And, uh, and you know, somebody asked me the other, the other day, you know, when I started rehearsing Orleans in our basement um, in Woodstock, New York. Did I know we were going to be successful? And I said, no, I didn't. But I assumed we were going to do a good job and that the songs would be good and the rearrangements would be good and that we would all sing and play. That's how. That's why I'm playing with these guys because they're really right. good. Yes. So I'm going to trust that everybody can sing and play their part really well and, and it'll be creative. We'll see about uh, whether it's successful or not. But but I didn't sit around going, hey, let's rehearse in the basement so we can go back to having a real job and, you know, play a couple of club gigs and then quit, quit. You know, so I, I you know, there, there is that. Right. And similarly, when I when I decided to run for office, any of the times I ran for office. Right. I mean, Congress was like, you know, people just were like, you're kidding. You're going to run for the United States House of Representatives. Like, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a citizen, right? And, uh, but you're and a musician. So, uh, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be doing those political things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm oh, I can hear the musician. judgment all over the a place. A tree hugging guitar player, right? Um, <laughs> what do I know about um, issues that go, you know, deeper? What, do, what? How much detail do I know about these questions? I'd like to proselytize about and. Um, you know, people who said that didn't realize I was reading half a dozen newspapers a day and, and talking to people and reading papers that were written by different folks and doing research. And, and uh, you know, that goes back to the no-nukes days when I was not only one of the four founding members of Muse, Musicians United for Safe Energy, which put those concerts on, but also was uh, me, Bonnie Raitt and I were uh, – well, Bonnie and I were on the foundation uh, on the Muse committee that started the concerts and and so on, um, along with Jackson Brown and Graham Nash. Mm-hmm. But um, but the Muse Foundation, which had to decide uh, how to give away the million bucks we raised at the concerts, uh, and that was real money back in 1979. And yes. uh, so I had to read all these. I don't know thousand proposals and requests for funding and narrow it down to relatively few that we could give money to. And, but I didn't mind doing the work. 
So, you know, when people said, you know, you know, you'll never be able to get even past a primary, let alone win this general election um, in a traditionally Republican district, I, I, I just went, OK, well, we'll see. My theory was I was going to make him spend money to beat me so somebody in some other state could win. Because there's a finite amount. Well, at that point, there was a finite amount of money. After Citizens United in 2010, it's not finite anymore. And that's one of the things that's really wrong with our democracy. And I, 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 uh, I hope that we get a president and a Senate who will nominate and uh, confirm justices who see corporations as not being people and, uh, and money not as protected speech. Because uh, that way, you know, a billionaire has a billion times more speech than a regular person does. And that's, that's not what the founders of this country intended. No, not at all. So do you ever procrastinate? <laughs> ever? <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I do. I mean, you've accomplished a lot and you do a lot of things. And so I'm, I, I was just I wondering. Expert. Like, I tend to procrastinate and then. When I get a deadline, I'm good at it. Um, and uh, so I'll, sometimes I make deadlines for myself. Right now, I've got an album that's scheduled for release in January, and I'm going in the studio Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, finishing up the last three tracks for it, uh, which you would think with it, that being December that I would be done already for January release. But the nice thing about this digital world is that things can actually be finished later and still come out on schedule. So, so we'll see, but yeah, I procrastinate and I beat myself up about it. And then I, uh, and then I remember that, you know, I will get it done. So, uh, after I finish this record, maybe I'll finish that sailing book. Yes. I I told you I wrote a book. Uh, I don't know if it was in the bio I sent you. I wrote a book called still the one. A Rock and Roll Journey to Congress and Back that came out in 1986. It was self-published on Amazon. And the story of basically from some of the things I've told you, starting out with coming downstairs in my footy pajamas when I was four and playing piano for my parents' dinner guests, and then going all the way from there up through Orleans into politics, a lot of stories about that, and then back to uh, music again and kind of up to the present. It's a pretty interesting read, if I do say so. And I've heard that from other people, so it's not just me. Well, I'll make sure that the, a link to that book is in the show notes, Ed, so that anybody <laughs> listening can can go grab a copy of it. I'm, no, I'm going to get one. <laughs> because I think that y- your story and how you have really mastered in a lot of ways, a lot of very interesting things that you're interested in, things that were important to you. You stepped into the arena and you took action and didn't stop yourself from taking the action that you thought was really important at the time. And it was important. And you were successful as a result of that. And that's real common. That's what gifted people do. And a lot of people don't understand that just because you can be an activist for the environment and you play guitar and you're a musician doesn't mean that that's all there is to you. There's so much more to what's going on here. And I laugh because I, a lot of people look at me and go, why would you want to work with musicians and stuff? You know, like they're just, you know, just all up there doing that. I said, no, none of the ones I know, they're, they're just wonderful quality people with amazing views and amazing ideas. And there's way more to everyone that I know, every musician that I know than anyone looking at them from the audience watching them could ever even begin to understand. Yeah, I, I see that too. And I'm a fan of music and of performers, mu- musicians mm-hmm. and singers as every bit as much as I am, hopefully a colleague uh, and sometimes a coworker. But yeah, um, gee, I didn't even tell you about how I learned to ski when I was in my 40s so that I could be a chaperone with my daughter's school group because that was the only way she said she would go and learn to ski. Uh, And I wound up getting obsessed with that and getting certified uh, by the Professional Ski Instructors of America. And uh, in 1997, I was instructor of the year at Hunter Mountain in the Catskills and spent probably 100 days on snow for several years in a row. 
So wow. that's in a perfect example of giftedness, everybody. Did you hear that? His daughter said he could only go if he learned how to ski. He didn't just learn how to ski. He mastered it and then mastered it again and then was instructor of the year. Like, see, that is what a gifted person does. A not gifted person would say, okay, I'll learn just enough or maybe not even learn it and just give up on being the chaperone with his daughter's trip. So that was a perfect, very casual example of what it's like being somebody with a multidimensional talent set. So that's perfect. That was great. (laughs) I love it. I'm really interested in how knowledge transfers Mm -hmm. from teacher to student and uh, had to learn for the PSIA, you know, ski instructor thing. I got certified level one and then, couple of years later, level two, which is a, quite a bit more difficult. I never made it to level three, at least not yet. But you have to learn about different teaching styles and learning styles. Mm-hmm. And it's it's uh, really interesting stuff. And, and you know, people are different. The teachers are different. Students are different. When you find a really good teacher, uh, that's something to hold on to. Yes, absolutely. Or someone to hold on to. There's great, there's great energy in that. There's an amplification when you find a really good teacher and you're open and the student and that relationship happens. There's this beautiful amplification that happens for both people, I think. So if somebody's listening to us and they're going, oh my gosh, I feel like him. Like I, I, I'm like that, but I don't know what to do. And they want to bring their giftedness out and they want to bring their special talents out, but they're kind of afraid or people have been putting them down. What would you say would be a good first step for somebody to start to step into the, you know, the authenticity of who they are, that yes, there's more going on with you than just one thing. Well, I would say start, you know, uh, if you're thinking about playing tennis or if you're thinking about riding a horse or, or uh, whatever the, activity is or the uh, pursuit you know when I started skiing I wasn't thinking I'm going to be an expert I was thinking uh, I just want to learn to get down the mountain safely and I did and but in the process of learning that I learned that there's much more to it and I wanted to get more and more of that so so the most important thing I think to do is it's up to you how far you go with it but don't be intimidated by people telling you how hard it is Right. And I think that, and also to give yourself permission to go as far down that rabbit hole as you want to go down that tangent as much as you want. If you want to know more and keep learning and learning and learning, then do it. And if you don't, and you've learned the beginning and that was enough and you're on to something else, that's great too, to, to really follow that, that inner desire, whatever that would be. Right. Yeah. Perfect. So I know um, I've asked you a lot of questions and I'm, wanting to know if there's anything that you wanted to say to everybody before I ask you the last couple of questions of the interview that you sure. had on your heart to share it's that probably, maybe I didn't you know, ask. Here's something that's on my heart and it's big in my life. You can use it or not, whatever works, but I'm uh, in recovery from various substance abuse issues or phases. I mean, back when, when I was uh, first playing music in the sixties and starting uh, with Orleans in the seventies you know, and there's a stretch there where uh, being on the road as a musician and uh, getting high or drinking was kind of de rigueur, or at least, you know, it wasn't looked askance at when when somebody got uh, got loaded. And and I, uh, I quit a couple times with the help of the 12-step programs, and the uh, first time for 19 years, and uh, the second time now for the last five years and uh it's a long story why i why i relapsed in the middle of that time but but it really is all and and now i'm actually going to al anon more than i am to um Mm. the other programs because it helps me deal with people it helps me deal with it helps me control my urge to tell other people what to do Mm. and uh think i know best for someone else it never works anyway, <laughs> trying to tell somebody what to do. Right. <laughs> so it didn't work with me. Going back to my parents, you know, it didn't work. So that's really huge. And it's been it's been great to learn how to live in the moment, in the day, not wishing for a different past or trying to pro- project what I think might be a better future, when in fact, the future that's coming that my, uh, my uh, higher powers bringing me may be uh, 
better than what I imagine or what I would like. And so um, I had a tennis coach, actually, who's one of these teachers I was speaking about, right. who uh, nailed this one time. I took my first lesson with him. I was a ping pong player with a lot of wrist and racquetball, lots right. of wrist. And so in tennis, it doesn't work. No wrist. Well, maybe when you get more advanced, it works. But when you're starting out, having a lot of wrist action is not good. So, um, so he was on the other side of the net with a shopping cart full of tennis balls hitting into my forehand. And the first few balls I sprayed out of the court. And he came over to my side of the court and he said, uh, John, I just want you to keep your eye down right where the strings meet the ball. When the racket is touching the ball, it's the only time you have any control over where it's going to go. If you look up to see what's going to happen, it's going to go out of the court. So keep your eye around that spot. He showed me pictures of Martina Navratilova with that famous backhand slice. It was the back of the Daily News, I think, during the U.S. Open. She had hit a ball, was hitting that slice, and the ball's out of the picture, and her eyes are back here. The racket's following through, and her eyes are back where the point of contact was. And I think she showed me a picture of Pete Sampras or Andre Agassi or somebody from the same tournament doing the same thing. And if you look at golfers or hitters and baseball sluggers, you know, their eyes will be back here. The ball's already headed over the fence. Uh, and I mean, sometimes they look at, they'll drop the bat and look up and, but for the immediate, uh, time, they, they keep their eye on the point of contact. And it just is a way for me to understand how important it is to be in the moment. Yes. Being in the moment is totally important. And, and I think that um, 12 step work is amazing and powerful no matter how anybody gets in there, because I really think it helps people learn how to live life on in a way that's manageable and with a structure and support and people there. I mean, I've run um, substance abuse treatment centers for decades and helping people really see that, that I think that the people who are highly sensitive and highly gifted who end up in any form of recovery life is because they have a higher calling and, and it's time to step into that. And we can only do that if we're in the moment, living out our gifts as cl cleanly as we can in alignment as much as possible. So I think what you shared was completely appropriate. Great. So the last two questions are my, no, they're not my favorite, but I love these questions. One of them is, because you've traveled a lot and everything, what's your most memorable food that you've ever eaten? <laughs> uh, <laughs> nobody's ever asked me that before. Um, most memorable food? Um, I, would, I would probably say sushi in Japan. Uh, it's just, it's so much easier to get uh, really good sushi and really fresh sushi there than it is in most places in the United States. But um, but actually my favorite food now is that I cook for myself. I've uh, been making some great salads. I'm growing my own uh, uh, microgreens at home. And, uh, you know, and I can get organic um, produce and fruit and so on. But, I, you know, last night I had a, a salad that was uh, – Broccoli microgreens uh, with uh, organic, little organic tomatoes and uh, avocado and and uh, organic red pepper and, or yellow pepper and and uh, you know it's, to me it's important to make it look good as well as taste good and uh, and I I can feel I'm not really a professional grade chef or anything I just I like doing this stuff and trying to make it, especially since I'm locked down here by myself, I, how can I make this really interesting? And, and um, so that's, you know, that's kind of where I'm at now is I, I, uh, I have a little electric grill that I use outdoors on the deck when the weather permits. And, uh, and uh, I make salads and, uh, and, you know, bowls of berries and stuff like that, which are, to me, that's kind of how I eat now. Yeah. And um, pretty much of a uh, vegetarian with the occasional uh, dip into the fish or 
foul, not so much, but uh, but no red meat. And it's partly because I, I've read some things about what the farming, especially in the rainforest, clearing um, clearing forests for growing for grazing cows, what it what's doing to the environment there and around the world. And I just can't be a part of that. So so I don't spend my money on uh, on right. meat animal. Right. That makes perfect sense. So if you were going to have a billboard that everybody was going to see that was going to have your name on it, what would the quote be on this billboard that the whole world's going to see? Uh, well, my new record uh, that's going to come out in January is called Reclaiming My Time. And um, that's what you say on the floor of the House of Representatives. If, if I'm recognized by the speaker and I have five minutes and I'm talking about how important it is to have fresh salad greens and, or whatever, Right. And somebody across the aisle goes, uh, if I may, Congressman, I'd like to add something. And I say, I'll yield two minutes of my time to so-and-so, gentleman from Iowa. And then when I want my time back to finish what I'm just going to say, I say, reclaiming my time, I'll go on to say that, blah, blah, blah. So the record is kind of as a play on that because it's also reclaiming the 10 years total I spent in elective office and what music I might have been doing during that time. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's something I'm really excited about. So, so a billboard, John Hall, reclaiming my time. Yes. So uh, is good. Yes. That's a great billboard. And I, and I like the backstory to it. So everybody, if you're listening to John and you're as fascinated as I am, check out the show notes with how to follow him and reach him and and buy his album and buy his book and um, enjoy his music because he's a really gifted person who has taken all of his giftedness and his overexcitabilities and been successful in multi areas, just like all of us can. We just have to be willing to go down those tangents. So John, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. <laughs> and, and thank you for um, all the stories. Like I'm just it's an honor to know you and it's an honor to hear all of your adventures. And now I will never hear any of the music from Orleans the same again. So thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks so much, Sam. Okay. Remember everybody that you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there, let your light shine. And remember that with every good thing you do, every blessing you put out there, it comes back times 10. So till the next episode, if someone gets me, be well.